Are you in a playground or a battleground? What did you sign up for when you became a believer? Did you sign up to be in a playground or a battleground? And the answer that, to that question will make all the difference in your life. So I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is a great message. We're going to continue talking about how to deal with the devil. And for the next three messages, I'm going to focus on this passage because Paul, writing from prison, gives Timothy keys to overcome the enemy. So have you got 2 Timothy chapter 2? It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men and women. Commit these to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others. You know, that this generation and the next generation need you to be faithful. They need men and women that no matter what happens, they are committed to following Jesus. The reason I'm here today is because around me as I grew up were men and women of great faith that refused to move under the heat of battle. And I looked at those men and women and said, I want to be like you. And I want you to know today that there are young people in the Lord that need you to be faithful and strong and not wilt under pressure. Commit these to faithful men who will be able, empowered. See, the Lord's not looking for rock stars. He's looking for men and women that would stand up and follow Jesus no matter what the cost. And He would empower those ordinary men and women to teach others. Therefore, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't want that. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for the playground version. He says, no, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. For nobody engaged in warfare. Is anyone engaged in warfare today? I'll give you a hint. It's everybody. The moment you give your life to Jesus, there's a target on your head. It says the recipient of warfare. It'll be the making of you. No one engaged in warfare entangles themselves with the affairs of this life, that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And then it goes on to talk about an athlete and a farmer. And Paul gives three pictures that you and I need to understand if we are going to be successful in spiritual warfare. And the first one today is fighting like a good soldier. Thank you, Joshua. Let's pray. Father, today, as this word goes forth, let it go forth like a two-edged sword. I'm asking, Lord, that you would bring into submission every thought, every desire in this place. Lord, may every thought come captive to the obedience of Christ. Lord, I pray that every lie of the enemy would be exposed and brought down and that you would have your way that Jesus would be glorified in this place that you would give your people strategy today to fight the good fight my prayer is today Lord that there would come in this house warriors sent out to the four corners of the globe, that you would raise up men and women filled with the Holy Ghost that are ready and able to engage in the warfare that is before us and come out as mighty, victorious conquerors. Conquerors in the business realm, conquerors in education, conquerors in their family and their marriage, Conquerors in government, in every area. I'm asking, Lord, today, let there be a seed sown today that propels people into their destiny, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Pull out your Bible, your notepads. You're going to need them today. There's a lot of lies in the church. There's a lot of lies that, come, that Christians 
take on. But one of the biggest lies in the church, the devil has convinced believers that life is a playground and not a battleground. If I was to ask the majority of Christians what they thought life was about, they would tell me that their life goal is to have to be happy, that their primary goal is to be happy, and that God is committed to their happiness. Deathly silence here. Because we want life to be a playground. We want life to be a playground, and so we are committed to making it a playground. We're committed to being consumers that find things to make us feel good and make us happy. The problem is that when you read through the Bible, we are never told to make the pursuit of happiness our goal. It's called idolatry. God is not here to make you happy. There's a radical thought. You see, many people have made an unspoken deal with God and they think that God agreed to it. Lord, if I read my Bible and go to church and live a fairly moral life, if I serve in church when Pastor Andrew asks occasionally, then I want you to respond accordingly with prosperity, a nice family, peace, lots of good times, enough money left over for a holiday to the Bahamas or wherever you want to go. And so, Lord, let's do a deal. I, I'll do this and you do that. And we think if we make God happy by doing all the right things, God will do the right thing by us and make us happy. But life is, for many of us, probably for most of us, is not turning out to be a playground. And so we have that standoff with God where many Christians today in church are ticked off with God because they made an agreement with God and God co-signed that agreement in their mind and we would do our bit for God and God would do His bit and make our life great and happy and everything would work out forever and ever, full stop. We signed up to be in a playground, not a battleground. Nobody told me when I got born again that I'd be in a war, that there'd be a battleground. I, was, I signed up for the God that would make everything come true. He'd give me unlimited supply of cheeseburgers. And the reason it's not turning out that way, church, is because God is letting us know that the world is not a playground. Since the fall of man... Life has always been a battleground and not a playground. And if you sign up for the God version of the playground, you are going to be deeply disappointed in God and in yourself and those around you. But if you sign up for the God that leads you into battle, you're going to be the most fulfilled person in all the world. The problem is that we've signed up for the wrong version of Christianity. It's the playground version. And the truth is the world that you live in is a battleground. The bullets are real. They're not pretend bullets. The sword is sharp and it hurts. And you and I know that people around us have been taken out by the enemy. They've been seduced. They've been tricked. They have got angry at God. They've checked out. They've done all sorts of things because they didn't understand that they were in a battleground and not a playground. And they're pouting in the corner. They're upset with God, angry at God, angry at all sorts of things because they thought God was going to make their lives so lovely. And now they're carrying scars and wounds because they didn't realise they were in a battle. Playgrounds belong to little children. Battlegrounds belong to men and women of great faith. And the truth is, and I'm not, I love the church. Nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but very few people love the church as much as I do. I love the church. It's in my DNA. But as I look at the church, I realize 
that much of the church is filled with people with a playground mentality. God wants to make you fulfilled. It's not that God doesn't want you to be happy. So I, I'm not introducing you to a God that's some sadness that takes great pleasure in making our life miserable. God wants to fulfill you, but it's in the context of a battle. And if our expectations about life would, were to be tweaked to understand that life is a battleground and not a playground, then our perspective about life, our goals change. Because we're in a war. When you're in a war, you think differently to when you're in a playground. If you've studied and watched what's been taking place in Ukraine and, and, and places, centres of war, everything changes when a war and bullets are going. You don't care about things that a civilian cares about because you know one wrong move, run, one day where you are lax, where you are apathetic, and your head can be taken off because you're in a war. So if we have this perspective, life takes on a new meaning. So Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Be strong, my son, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you heard from me, he says, Commit these to faithful men who will be able to pass it on to others. And he says, And you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So when you read Paul's epistles, they, are, they, are, they carry a militaristic mindset. There's a theme of spiritual warfare and fighting the good fight right through his letters to the church. Florence Nightingale put it this way. She's not in the Bible, by the way, but it's worthy of a quote. I don't, where was Florence? She's not there. She said... Life is a hard fight, a struggle, a wrestling with the principle of evil. It's hand to hand, foot to foot. Every inch of the way is disputed. Here's a woman that realised that the Lord has assigned us to a battle and not a playground. So there's a number of factors about this battleground that you and I need to realise. And you may want to write these down. We're going to unpack this scripture in a moment. But the first thing about this battleground is it's situated in an invisible world, not a visible world. So you can't see the wind and sound waves and atoms, but they exist. And we know they exist because we see the effects of the wind. We know the wind exists because we see the trees move. And the same thing about this invisible world that we live in, we know it's true because we see the effects in people's lives. If you don't believe in a dark, sinister, invisible world, just go to prison. I've been to Pantridge as a visitor and walked through and seen the effects of an invisible world. Men... In prison, there were once little babies in the hands of their mothers, innocent, with all the world in front of them, and somehow they encountered evil spirits of the invisible world and they started making wrong choices and they went down a track that was never designed for them. Oh, yes, an invisible world is there and it's real. The second thing is that we... You and I are engaged in this invisible world. Our enemy is powerful. He is real. And his goal is to take you out. Look at me. The enemy has one goal is to kill you, destroy you and to steal from you. That's the reality of this battleground that we're in. The third thing I'd say is that that leads on is that this enemy that's in this invisible world is a very powerful enemy. Now, there's context this because we say the devil is, is nobody, he's, he's not the equal of God and he's nothing to worry about. But the truth of the matter is, as you study scripture, it appears that he was the highest created being. He's not the opposite of God, obviously, but he's 
no fool. And if you, in your flesh or your distraction or your naivety, think that you can take the devil on, he will eat you up and spit you out for breakfast. He's a formidable foe who has had generations of experience and of knowing what to do to take you out. This is not a game. The bullets are real. The swords are sharp. We're up against an enemy that is committed to taking out the church, taking out individuals and discrediting the name of Jesus Christ. That's his goal. This is not a game. It's not playground. This is a battleground. Well, I don't want to be in it. You have no choice. So best to know what you're in than to live deluded. You are not in a playground. You're in a battleground. I didn't come to church to hear this. Well, you're here now and you're going to hear it because maybe God wants to wake you up. Because if you signed up for the wrong world, you're in a lot of trouble. Hmm. The fourth thing about this battleground is even though this enemy is powerful, we are to respect, when I say respect him, I don't mean to honour him, but we are to be aware of his power. But we need to know about the enemy that he's not, he's not all powerful. We are not to fear him. The Bible reveals the nature of the enemy, not so that we would be intimidated by him, but so we would be forewarned and forearmed. St. John of the Cross said, the devil fears a soul that's united to God as much as he fears God himself. Did you hear that? We are no match for the devil, but once we are in Christ Jesus and we know our spiritual authority and our weapons, and we're going to talk about this in a, in a moment, when we conduct ourselves as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, the enemy is no match for a man or a woman that is ready for battle. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Come on, not a golf clap, a big clap. So verse 4 of 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, No one, say no one with me. No. So there's no exception here. No one engaged in warfare. So everyone here today, no exception. And everyone here is in a war. I don't feel like I'm in a war. You're in a war, you just don't know it. And he can take you out with a stab or he can just take you out slowly. But if you don't know that you're in a war, you're a prime candidate to be taken out. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this world. So he would please the one that enlisted him as a soldier. This word warfare is really important. Paul likens our spiritual battle to the commitment of the great Roman soldiers of his time. So as you read the book of Timothy, Paul is, it's really interesting because Jesus comes to earth at the right moment in time. And one of the reasons he came because the dominant force in the world was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire physically was a very clear description of what we are to be spiritually. And so Paul, with this mindset of the Roman Empire, begins to talk about warfare. He says, nobody engaged in warfare. Do you know that word warfare? It's a what they call a present participle, which is an ongoing thing. So he's saying... No one involved in constant warfare. Let me tell you something today. From the moment you're born again to the last breath that you take on earth, you are engaged in warfare. You're not in a playground. And best you know it right now. It, it would do you... Well, to go and read, this is a side note, the, the origin and the beginnings of the Salvation Army mindset.
No one engaged in warfare. This word warfare is used to describe the function of a soldier, that he would fight and war and conquer. And it talked about the intense training that and the hardship that was imposed on Roman soldiers. So this is what Paul had in mind. No one engaged in warfare, this constant warfare. And there was a soldier and he was training and he was hardened for battle. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles themselves in the affairs of this life. The word, the Greek word for affairs is uh, pragmatia, and it, it, that's where we get the, the word now, pragmatic. And, and he was saying, you can't get caught up in the basic affairs of this world. Yes, we have to function in this world, but don't get distracted by living like a civilian when you're in a battle. You can't get entangled with the affairs of this life because we have to be focused on the war because if we don't, we're going to lose our head. If you get caught up, if listen to me, if you, your family, your marriage, whatever it is, if you get consumed with living life like everyone else, caught up in the affairs of this world, overly caught up, Paul's saying you're going to get taken out. Really, Andrew? Yeah, really. I'll give you an example, a biblical example, just so you can't say it's not true. The Lord said to Gideon, I want you to lead Israel against the Midianites. So it's Gideon and his Gideonites versus the Midianites. Okay, I can do that, Lord. Right, assemble your church, Gideon. And uh, let's, let's, let's rumble with the enemy. So Gideon, you know, he's got a fairly a bit of a mega church. He's leading 32,000 people in his church, the church of the first Gideonites. And, uh, and so he's getting ready for battle against the Midianites and he's outnumbered four to one. So I think there's 135,000 Midianites and 32,000 of the local church of the first Gideonites. So they get ready for battle and the Lord says, uh, before you go out to battle, Gideon, I've got some, some bad news for you. You know that church that you're a pastor? Um, they aren't with you, buddy. You've got some problems there. Um, there's 22,000 of them that are fearful and anxious. Don't take them with you. Think about that. 22,000 men from his church of the Gideonites are ill-equipped for battle because they're afraid. Afraid of their future, afraid of their money, afraid of getting sick, afraid of losing their wife, afraid, afraid, fearful, fearful, fearful. And they will get taken out if you take them into battle. Leave them behind. So Gideon's left with 10,000. Now he's outnumbered 13 to 1. And God says, hey, Gideon, you're still outnumbered. Sorry, you've still got too many. You're outnumbered, yes, but now you've got too many. I'm going to do some more division for you. I'm going to just, see, because God's not concerned with how many people. He's concerned with what kind of people. God's never been intimidated by a battle. I mean, as we read the Bible, it's never been about numbers. It's been about what kind of people. And we get worked up. Oh, we could never take the city because we don't have enough people. Let me tell you something. It's never been about the number. It's been about how many good soldiers do you have for battle. So he says, send them down to the, um, to the local Melbourne water park and uh, let them have a drink. And so you know, many of you know the story. Those that drank, they got down on their knees and they drank and they drank and they drank. They put their swords and shields down and they had a good drink. And then there were 300 left that didn't drink that way. They actually got down on one knee. They held on to their sword in one hand 
cupped the water and drank it out of their hand. And God says, there's the 300. Get rid of everyone else. You've found what you need. All those thousands of men that were fearful, taken out. And then you've got, so 22,000 fearful and 9,700 men that laid down their weapons and in totally engaged in drinking and were oblivious. What well, Number one, they could never have fought if the enemy came. And number two, because their heads were down in the water, they couldn't see the enemy coming. 300 scooped up the water, kept their weapons on them, had their head up high and were able to observe what was going on around them. And it's easy to bury our faith. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy. You've got people around you, Timothy, that, that are caught up in the affairs of this world. Their heads are so deep in the affairs of this world, they are unarmed, unable to defend themselves and have no clue that the enemy's coming for them because they're so focused on their own lives getting the job, and, and these are all necessary things. It's the obsession and the focus where, where we're just trying to be like everyone else, succeed and, and work and all these things. And Paul's saying a good soldier does not get obsessed with the affairs of this world because if you do that, you'll be taken out. He says he does that so he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. This word please was used, the Greek was used in classical Greek literature, oresco, and it means it's descriptive of these horses that were amazing horses that were trained, they were the best of the best and, and they were well proportioned and they were a pleasure to watch as they performed their duties. See, spiritual training helps us win personal battles, and that's really important. But the primary purpose is to make us warriors that when Jesus looks at, he says, I like what I see. That he may please the one who enlisted him. And so it, Paul's saying, you know what? The Father and the Son are in heaven right now. And they are wanting the people of God to get trained and prepared and alert. And he wants them to engage in battle because he personally takes satisfaction in you wielding your sword and taking the enemy out. And God says, look at my son, look at my daughter. They are, they are amazing to watch. And what Paul's saying is the father and the son take so much pleasure in the man or woman that has prepared themselves for battle. It's not just about us overcoming, because that's important, but there's more at stake. It's actually bringing, when you take a stand and all hell's coming against you and you refuse to quit and give up, crack the sads, you maintain a right attitude, joyful, forgiving, you endure under hardship. Father saying, that is my boy. It's amazing. Paul says, you're going to please the one that enlisted you. I thought about that. Is God getting a lot of pleasure at the moment with me in the way that I do spiritual warfare? Well, sometimes I reckon he is. There's been a few days where I've cracked the sads and said, I think I might be a fireman or a policeman, anything but a pastor. And he might be scratching his head. But on the whole, it's, I think he takes pleasure in the fact that men and women stand strong in the face of opposition and know how to wield their sword against the enemy. The setting of this letter that I told you before is surrounded by a dominant Roman Empire. And these soldiers that Paul talks about, 
And as I said before, Paul said to Timothy, if you want to be successful, you look at the way the Romans train their soldiers and you take that in the practical and you convert that into the spiritual and you will have great success, Timothy. You may know of this high-ranking Roman. His name was Vegetius. Have you heard of Vegetius? Anyone have heard it, read about him in school? Okay, so I can make it up then. Now, he was, he was one of the most high-ranking Roman officials and he wrote what is, even today, the most influential surviving document on how the Roman soldiers were selected and trained. He was alive at around about the 4th century. And so after the, the prime of the Roman Empire, but he went back and studied what had taken place. And the reason he did this was he was now surrounded by a Roman army that were overweight, that saw it as an obligation, that were unfit, unprepared for war. And he tried to say, well, what do we need to do as an empire to return these men back to the fighting force they were? I wonder if that's relevant for us today. If we look back on the church, maybe the early church, or even the church in the beginnings of this nation, that for many of them carried a militaristic mindset that the church doesn't have today. So he went back and studied that. And it's very interesting. And he concluded that the peasants in the Roman Empire made the best soldiers. And he gave seven reasons for that that I'm quickly going to share with you. Because this is what Paul is thinking when he's writing to Timothy about enduring hardship as a good soldier. So the good soldier is enlisted in an army and his sole purpose is to please the one that enlisted him. I ask you today, is the sole purpose of your life to be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ and to please him because he chose you to war for him. So he says there were seven reasons why the Romans picked peasants. You may want to write them down. I'll elaborate on a couple, not all of them. He said, firstly, the peasants were accustomed to extreme weather. It's part of their job. You know, Satan will blow into your life, all sorts of events. You'll get a, a wind, a winter season come from nowhere. And the peasants knew how to function in all sorts of extremities. The question is today for you and I is, can we outlast the storm that's in our life at the moment? Remember I told you about one of David's mighty men that took on a lion, a picture of Satan, in a pit, picture of the spirit realm on a snowy day. So it was like all hell broke loose. The snowy day is a picture of a winter season when it seems like God is far, far away. You know, you pray those prayers and it seems like you're just talking to yourself. God is a million miles away. But he took on this lion and killed him. So these peasants were experts at functioning in the extremity of the weather. If you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you're going to need to learn how to be functional in the good and the bad times. My idol growing up was a man, a couple called Reg and Nancy Garvin. And I've told this story many times. I'll tell it again. Because he was the captain coach of the St Kilda Football Club and he came to our church he was retired by then. And every single week in a church where, put it this way, it wasn't in its prime. There were some challenges there. It wasn't a church that you go to to be excited. 
and every week Reg and Nancy were in the aisle dancing, hand in hand, dancing to every song. I, I was like, I would watch them every week and think, you guys, either you don't realise what church you're in or you've been drinking something before church that I'm unaware of. There's something in your communion juice. I'd like a sip of that. But they knew what it was like to be a warrior and they knew how to function in every season. They weren't reliant on the song, the worship leader playing the right tune and having the right sermon. They, it, it was irrelevant. They were soldiers enlisted in an army and they knew the power of praise to take the enemy out. And so in many churches today, we have people that are so insipid. If, if every, every external thing in their world and in the church isn't perfect, then I don't want to praise. But the peasants, they, they knew how to function in the extremity of weather. So he said, pick them. He said, number two, they were used to hard work. I didn't have anything under this point because I, I thought that's self-explanatory. Because let me say this. It's remarkable post-COVID in the big churches and in the small, the dramatic decrease in the people of God's willingness to volunteer. I was talking to someone at about a big church that you would know of, massive church, and they have a major problem finding people to volunteer in their church because the people don't want to work anymore. Paul says, you've signed up as a good soldier. And this, this document said, if you want to find the best soldiers, pick peasants because they know the meaning of working hard every single day. That was a good point, Andrew. He, this is what he wrote. You can get the document now. He said, number three, they knew how to endure heat. So one of the things about the Roman soldier is that in the heat of the battle, physical heat, they were supreme athletes. If you study, and this is a side note, but you study the soldiers, everything they did was to prepare them for battle. So in other words, when they, every day they would sword fight in preparation and their swords that they carried were twice the weight of the sword they carry in battle. Everything in preparation so they could function as a powerful army. These peasants knew how to work every day in the heat. Number four, they lived simple, uncomplicated lives. Not stupid, but uncomplicated. Peasants lived uncomplicated lives. God's soldiers are free from anxiety and worry. See, I'm going to put it out, you don't need to agree, but a lot of the, some of the stress, some of the anxiety you may be experiencing is because you've made life complicated. You've made choices that have complicated your life because you want life to be a playground. And the good soldier, imagine if we all said, in all honesty, our sole ambition as a household is to serve the Lord and to be about his business. And we limited the option. It doesn't mean we become boring and have all bowl cuts and we're, you know, cardigans and eat tomato sandwiches. I'm not saying it's boring. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying it's about focus. And so, many of it, so much focus, so much stuff going on. And we pride ourselves on, have you had a busy week? Oh, yeah, it's been really busy. Oh, I'm so busy. There's no medals in heaven when you shake hands with Jesus and he welcomes you. You are the busiest person I have ever met. Well done, good and busy servant. But there's no rest for you in heaven because I know how much you enjoy busyness. So here's a mop and bucket over there. Now that doesn't, see, it flies in the face of what I said. We, we work hard 
but we're not distracted. We're about our master's business. And so whether you're in the corporate boardroom, wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, so I'm not inviting you all to join the monastery. I'm saying be about the Father's work. Be focused as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Everything that you do, wherever God places you, it's about His kingdom. And so you're ready for battle. They were content with having little. Well, you're a peasant, so you have little. And by this, I mean they didn't require a great deal of comfort and unnecessary additions. Imagine a Roman soldier saying to his commander, all right, I'll come at you to battle, but, you know, on the battlefront, I want a queen si- no, a king-sized doona, and in my tent, I want recycled air conditioning. I want some grapes. This is a battleground, not a playground. And the challenge is that we don't allow the blessings of God to move us from the combat zone to the comfort zone. And this is why some great men and women have been so reluctant to be successful because they knew the greatest danger is not when you're not successful, it's when you are successful. The same man that I read about before, Vigilius, he said somewhere here, whoever desires peace should prepare for war. And so in amongst all the blessing and the favour, be always prepared for battle. He goes on to say they were immune to fatigue. Peasants didn't have the right to say to their master, hey boss, you know that job he gave me, I'm not feeling up to it today. I, I think I'll just have a rest. I think I'll have a week off. Actually, I'm going to take it with full pay on sick pay. I'm, they never had that choice. The boss would say, do that, and they would do it. There was a job to be done, and the master was to be satisfied. And as I read about the New Testament church, endurance and patience, they said, was the queen of virtues. We have a lot of people talking about Christian burnout and fatigue. Now, whenever I preach this context, okay, so please don't go, Pastor Andrew said, I'm not, yes, there are seasons where you need to have a rest, okay? But that season doesn't look like 40 years, okay? It could be, it could be weeks or months. Context, of course. So please hear what I'm going to say in context. By and large, Christians don't have the option of claiming spiritual burnout and fatigue. We're in an army. They picked peasants because they knew how to work and they knew how to endure and not give up. And here's the deal in the war. You ready? You will not be defeated by the devil because you don't have enough power and authority. That will never be the reason. Here's the reason. You will be defeated by the devil because you did not know how to endure and you didn't value the quality of patience. That is the only reason why you will lose. There was a man, an emperor called Domitian. He, he was, he made Nero look like a choir boy. And uh, before the end of his reign, he, he cracked it with John the Apostle, who was the, now towards the end, the only remaining apostle. He died in his 90s, I believe. And Domitian thought he would rid himself of that man once and for all. And so they put a pot of boiling oil and threw John in there. Well, Domitian was really ticked off. He was supposed to kill the man. If I can't kill him, I'm going to make his life on earth a misery. 
And John writes about this in Revelation 1.9 and he says, I, I am John, your brother, a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. And he believed and the church believed if we had patience and endurance, we can overcome every work of the enemy. And Paul, uh, John made this point. As you read Revelation, I'm not moving. I'm not going to discredit Jesus Christ. I will not give up. He will not defeat me. The enemy will not defeat me. And church history tells us that he was then finally removed from the Isle of Patmos. Some people believe he died a natural death in Ephesus, but we do know this, he outlasted the emperor that banished him to the island. Yeah. Good soldier of Jesus Christ, patience and endurance. I know what it's like to endure, to have things in your heart where the enemy seems like he's trying to rob you. Don't quit, don't give up. You're a good soldier, Paul says to Timothy, of Jesus Christ. Satan has no counter for patience. He's impatient. And eventually he'll crack. The things that you're believing for, hoping for, it's a spiritual battle. It's a war. Do not give up. Use your spiritual weapons, the sword of the spirit, the prayer, prayer on all occasions, and fight the good fight, Timothy. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The seventh thing is, these peasants were accustomed to hard physical labour and carrying burdens. The upper crust of society knew nothing. Put a shovel in their hand, they, they would think it's a, a spoon. They didn't know what to do with it. These peasants, they knew how to carry burdens and they knew how to work hard. These were the seven things that the mission... Sorry? Yes wrote down. Paul says in 2 Timothy, why don't we turn to that again as we close. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You therefore, my son, imagine now Paul is standing here talking to us as a church. You therefore, church, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who can teach others. So the Lord's looking for faithful people today as soldiers. And he says, therefore, I want you to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For nobody engaged in warfare entangles themselves with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul was saying to Timothy, find faithful men, find faithful women who will enlist as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, who won't wilt under battle. What's this got to do with spiritual warfare, Pastor Andrew? Everything. Everything. You can't overcome the devil if you're in a playground mentality and not a battleground mentality. Because the moment you lose your toys in the playground, the moment you don't have a seesaw, the moment you haven't got a slide, the moment things get tough in your life, you'll get cross. You'll stop being a good soldier. You'll become a civilian. You'll get distracted. You'll try and medicate yourself and try all these things because you don't realise the day you got born again, you became a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You've been enlisted. You're enrolled in the army to the day you die. So endure hardship, the challenges, when the enemy comes against you. For you will overcome and you will have great victory. And here's the thing. If you learn from this, the Lord will look at you as you fight the good fight, as you stand strong in the realm that God has put you in, and he will have so much pleasure. He will see you like a stallion. He'll see you like a gladiator that when all the hordes of hell come against you, you don't quit. And you fight with the weapons that God has given you. 
So if you come back again in two weeks' time, I want to talk to you about an amazing thing that he then says. So first, you've got to endure as a soldier, but then you've got to understand how to train and compete according to the rules as an athlete. And here's the thing in spiritual warfare, there are rules to live by. And I want to share them with you in two weeks' time after Easter. And I believe they're going to be an incredible blessing to you. So good soldiers of Jesus Christ, stand to attention. Get back in the battle. Put on the armour of God. Grab the weapons that God has given you. Understand that every day that you wake up, there is a war going on and you need to be prepared for battle. Fight for your family, for your children, for your marriage, for the church, for the city. The war goes on around you. So when you wake up, salute and say, Lord, you've enlisted me. Here I am. Use me today for your glory. Amen. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for the privilege of being soldiers of the Lord. And we just ask today that you would strengthen us. For those that have been in a battle and they're weary, Lord, we don't diminish the, the intensity of the battle. I'm asking for the grace that you spoke about in this passage to be their portion. Strengthen them with might and cause them to fight the good fight, I pray. Equip them and strengthen them. And I see there were many that were fatigued by the battle and God is here to strengthen you and to empower you because you're not just any soldier, you're the soldier of the Lord, a powerful fighting machine that God has equipped for battle. I pray, Lord, bless them and strengthen them today. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.